thank Him for so much, to praise Him for you see, He has been so good to me. was really sweet. Thank you. God bless you for that. Well, we do have a lot to thank God for, don't we? We really do. And one of our problems is that we don't stop to think of all of the things he's done for us. Um, it's important that we be thankful people. One of the marks of the world is that they're unthankful. And one of the marks of God's people should be thankfulness. Now today, um, I'm, I'm going to preach a message to help prepare us for our, uh, our missions conference that's coming up in just two weeks. And uh, what I'd like to do is talk with you about a miracle. Everyone likes a, to see a miracle. And I'd like to talk with you about that. I want to talk about God's missionary mathematics. Let's begin with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we bow once more before your heavenly throne of grace. Thank you that even... Even from way up there, you can hear us on earth. And somehow, Lord, you can be everywhere at the same time. And so here we are in your house, and you're here with us too. Please teach our hearts today some spiritual truth. Lord, I pray every one of us would catch the significance of uh, what we're about to talk about. Please help us get excited that we serve a risen Savior. We serve a living God. We're on the winning side. Lord, help us to live by faith and bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, maybe you've learned this, that sometimes in life things don't always make sense. Hmm? Things sometimes happen and we say, how did that happen? And we try and figure it just doesn't add up. You know, they don't make sense. They don't seem logical. And sometimes this happens in mathematics as well. Now, I've got an example for you here of a missing dollar, a story about a missing dollar. And I'd like you to follow this story. A few years ago, three guys stopped off at a motel room for a night. The newly hired desk clerk told them the cost of the room would be $30. He made a mistake, but he told them $30. And so the guys said, okay, and they each paid $10. Later on, the new desk clerk realized his mistake. The room should have only cost $25. So he called the maid over and gave her five $1 bills and said, take these $5 over to the guys in room 303 there and give it to those three guys. Now, she did, and the guys got these $5 back, and they didn't know how to split $5 equally amongst the three of them, so they decided to keep a dollar each and give the last $2 to the maid as a tip. Are you following the story? Okay, so far sound, sounds good. The maid went back to the new desk clerk, and the two of them tried to figure out the math. Now, are we ready? Glenn, is this thing ready? Okay, all right, good. So they got out a piece of paper, and they wrote on the paper, the cost of the room was $30. And then they figured, well, there's a $5 refund. So that meant that there was only $25. That's what the room cost. Um, each guy, of course, ended up only paying $9, right? Because they kept a dollar each, so it meant they only paid $9. Nine times three is 27. And then the, the maid showed her $2 tip. And uh, they added that on. Hmm, said the desk clerk. Originally, they all gave me $30. And all we can account for is $29. And so there's a dollar missing somewhere. Where did that dollar go? And they just looked at each other bewildered. Do you all understand it? Yes? $30. It should have only been 25, so here's $5 back. They didn't know what to do, so they kept three and they gave two to the girl. She goes back to the desk clerk and says, well, here's what happened. And they do the math and they only come up with $29. So what in the world happened? Where did that dollar go? Now that's, that's a funny thing, isn't it? That's a funny thing. Uh, it's strange, but there is a bit of trickery to this. A little bit of trickery. Um, just like this next one I'm going to show you. 
Um, 5 plus 5 plus 5 equals 550. Now that is a false statement. Would you agree with that? That looks pretty bad, doesn't it? That's pretty poor math. However, by adding one line, one single line, you can turn that false statement into a true statement. Now, maybe you've seen this before, maybe you haven't, but uh, you can show this to your friends after. How about that? So you've really learned something today coming to church, right? So I get to draw one line. So you write it out for them on a paper. You give them the pencil, draw one line. It can be as long as you want, as short as you want. One line will turn that false statement into a true statement. And when they finally give up, you say, here's the one line. Do you understand it? That one line now changed the false statement of 5 plus 5 plus 5 into 545 plus 5 equals 550. Now, there's a little bit of trickery, of course, to all that, that kind of thing. And that's just fun. Oops. That's just fun. Take that away, okay? Thank you very much. Um, what, what really happens, though, when God himself gets involved? In normal life, we, we live by normal natural laws, laws of physics and gravity. You know, uh, those are normal natural laws of life that we live by. But what happens when God gets involved with normal natural life? What happens? I'll tell you what happens. God bends his own laws. He bends his own laws of physics and nature and mathematics so that the impossible happens. When God gets involved with the normal, you have the supernatural happening. That's what happens when God gets involved. In a week and a half, we will begin our annual Faith Promise Missions Conference. It's going to start on a Wednesday. And it's all about God seeing, uh, us seeing God do a miracle through our church. Why? So that he can send the gospel around the world. Why? So that people will get saved. That's the miracle, folks. Did you know that the Christian life begins with a miracle? Did you know that? How many here would say, I have been Born again. Raise your hand if you believe you've been spiritually born again. Okay, you may put your hand down. Thank you. That was a miracle. Not that you raised your hand, but that you got born again. You say, how many times can you get born? Old Nicodemus, he was kind of posed with this. How can a man be born again? Can he go back into his mother's womb a second time and be born? No, 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 no. You have to be born spiritually a different way. And it's just as real as the physical birth, so is the spiritual birth, and that is a miracle. The Christian life begins with a miracle. The only way you can become a Christian is through the second birth, the spiritual process. And it's just as real as the physical process that got you into the world in the first place. But it's a miracle. But listen to this. God never intended for the miracle to stop. When you were born physically, your parents rejoiced, oh, he or she is born, hooray, okay, goodbye. And out they went. They left you at the hospital and you, you just died, right? That's not what happened. That would be a tragedy. The miracle didn't stop the day you were born, the moment you were born. It continued. And you continued to develop and grow and walk and talk and feed yourself and all kinds of things. Change the channels yourself, right? All those things. It's a continuation of that physical miracle. And just as you were born spiritually, that miracle was never intended to stop. The idea of the Christian life is a miracle, a miraculous new life. And uh, this is what we're talking about here. Um, that's why the Bible says the just shall live by faith. I'll tell you what. You do not need any faith to see 2 plus 2 equals 4. You don't, you don't need faith for that. But what you do need faith is for 2 plus 2 to equal 5. <laughs> You'd need faith to see God turn 2 plus 2 into 5. I've never seen on paper 2 plus 2 equals 5, except if I haven't written it right. Normally, naturally, 2 plus 2 equals 4. But when God gets involved, you see, he bends the normal natural laws that he set into place, and that's where the miracles come in. 
and the Christian life was meant to be a miraculous life. Now, folks, hold on here. I'm not talking about, okay, you can go out there and you can walk across the Fraser River. All right, okay, you can uh, jump off the roof and fly like a bird and fly to the moon and back. I'm not talking any nonsense like that. I'm talking things that will bring honor and glory to God in fulfilling God's will on earth. And these things require miracles. God has set up life with normal natural laws, but when God gets involved, when we ask him to get involved, then the miraculous happens. And I'm talking today about God's missionary mathematics. When it comes to missions, God will do the miracle through us. The supernatural, a miracle, ability to do more, to make more, to give more, to love more. That's what God's miracles are all about. Listen, can I remind you, please, that the children of Israel coming out of Egypt had to get away from Pharaoh and they crossed the Red Sea. The sea parted and they went through and crossed as if it were on dry ground. And that's as real a happening, as real, as real as anything. But how could it? The normal natural laws do not allow for such things. Maybe you say, I know, I, I stood on the shores of the Pacific and I, I raised my arms and I said, divide, and nothing happened. Yeah, but when God wants something done and God says divide, it'll divide. Because when God gets involved, he bends the normal natural laws so that miracles happen when God gets involved. And the crossing of the Red Sea, Pharaoh should have gotten those Jews and brought them back to Egypt. That's what should have happened had the normal natural laws been left alone. But God got involved and bent those laws and opened the Red Sea for them. After the Jews got through, Pharaoh said, let's get them, boys. And they tried going through. And God says, uh, no, you won't. And he just closed the sea on top of them. And it was heaps upon heaps of dead bodies on the shore that day. Can I remind you that the walls of Jericho were built so big, so strong, so high, they were impenetrable. And listen, the walls of Jericho, those Canaanites should have been safe within those walls. God said, God got involved and told Joshua to take the people and march all around. Don't say a word, just march all around. Next day, do it again. Next day, do it again. On the seventh day, they went around seven times. Then they all blew their trumpets and they shouted and the walls came crashing down. That should not have happened. Those walls were built to withstand uh, uh, pressures and should have lasted hundreds of years. The normal natural laws were bent. Who bent them? God bent them because God got involved. God shows himself strong when he gets involved. Can I remind you that Joshua was in pursuit of the enemy and the sun was going down and they weren't going to be able to get all the enemy and so he cried out to God and that sun stood still. That should not have happened. The normal natural laws should have meant that the bad guy escaped. That's what should have happened that day. But when God got involved, he just halted the sun that's why we have Joshua's long day. And Joshua then and his armies pursued after the enemies and won the victory that day. You read about that in the Bible. Can I remind you that Samson was only one man? And he didn't, he didn't have these Arnold Schwarzenhager arms and chest on him. He wasn't like that. He was just a normal looking man. And there were 3,000 Philistines trained, combat ready, with armor on, the normal natural laws did not prevail that day because if they had, they would have not only caught Samson, they would have killed Samson. But God got involved. What happened? Samson won against 3,000. Unbelievable. Incredible. Can I remind you that David, as a teenager, showed up to battle Goliath a nine foot six inch giant weighing perhaps 500 pounds. You say, people, they, they don't live like, oh yeah, yeah. There's been freaks of nature and we've gotten some great big giants in the past. And he was one of them. And he was a trained warrior. He knew how to fight. That's how he was raised. He was built like a Sherman tank. And there he was standing big, ugly, great big tower of a guy. And there's little teenage David with his slingshot. The normal natural laws, if they had prevailed that day, 
would have seen David barbecued, skewered there and put on a spit and roasted. And Goliath said, I'll take your head off your, your body. I'll feed your body to the crows. That's what should have happened. But God got involved. What happened? A teenage boy sunk a stone, maybe the size of my fist, deep into the forehead of that giant. Where was his helmet? The normal natural laws did not prevail that day. I don't know. Maybe he kind of moved a little bit. I'm not sure. But that stone went deep into his forehead. He fell flat on his face. The Philistines didn't know what they were looking at. They, in disbelief, their jaws open, their eyes wide, their tongue hanging out. They're looking at their champion flat on his face while David comes, draws Goliath's own sword, raises it, and whacks the guy's head off. All of a sudden, boom, they turn and run like scared schoolgirls, just crazy, out of their mind. Whoosh, off they went as the Jews pursued them. The normal natural laws did not prevail that day either, did they? Can I remind you also, please, that Jesus said to the disciples to launch out and let their nets down for a draft of fish. And can I remind you that the professional fishermen... Peter and James and John and a few others, the professionals who knew all about fishing, and they knew that lake like the back of their hand. They said to Jesus, Master, we've toiled all night. Now, the all night meant the fishing season. You know, fish will often eat at night. They'll come closer to the shore and eat and so on. We toiled all night. We've caught nothing. The season's over. The fish are back out and they're down deep. But nevertheless, at thy word... I'll let down the net. And so they did. And they couldn't bring it in. There were so many fish. The normal natural laws were bent that day. Can I remind you of one more? A little boy whose mother bought him a little lunch. Five loaves and two fish. Now, son, you could be hungry. Oh, mom, come on, take your lunch. See, boys should listen to their mothers. Amen, mothers? Oh, yeah, I got a few amens that time. Apparently, he was the only one that had anything to eat. No one else thought of food. He's the only one that had, had dragged along this lunch. Oh, what am I bringing this thing for? Well, here's why. Because Jesus said, <clears throat> can I have your lunch? Why? I want to feed 5,000 people with your lunch. That lunch, the normal natural laws of that lunch should have fed one boy. Maybe one boy and his buddy. Maybe. But one boy. But when God gets involved, he bends. You see what I'm saying? And I'm saying that this, is, this same God is our God today. And God still is in the business of doing miracles. Now, in all these examples, the normal natural laws of physics and nature should not have allowed these things to happen. But when God gets involved, he bends the laws in order to make miracles happen. Now, your Bible is open, please, at Ephesians chapter 3. And I want you to see it. It's right there. We read about it. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able. Look at this. He's able to do. Now watch here. Watch this carefully. It's not that he's able to do above that ye ask or think. He's able to do abundantly above. And it doesn't stop there. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And it's according to the power that worketh in us. So it has something to do with us. Unto him be glory in the church. That's the idea. When God does the miracles, there's great glory to God in the church. See that? By Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now today we're talking about God's missionary mathematics. Where if we do it God's way, we will see a miracle. That's his promise. Now, for those that may be new to the idea of missions or new to the missions program of our church, here's what you need to know. Number one, this world has a serious problem. It's a serious sin problem, sin and eternal damnation problem. People need to be saved. They need to be born again in order to avoid ending up in hell. Number two, God's solution to getting people saved around the world is called missions. Number three, Missions normally should not work. Normally, according to the normal natural laws, missions should not work. It should fall flat on its face. Why? Because most of us Christians are too small to do anything. We're too poor and too broke and we just don't know how to do it. 
Missions should fail. Number four. But that's when God does his miracle missionary mathematics. If we'll do it with him, his way. Now take your Bible, please, and turn to the left. Turn to the left, back to 2 Corinthians. Not too far, just a few pages. And find chapter 8. Now there's a 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Please go to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 8, if you would, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Pause for a minute. Paul writing here, he says, now you, you Christians there at Corinth, we want you to know this. We want you to be uh, right up to snuff here with knowledge that the churches in Macedonia, which was another place of Asia Minor, it was another geographical area, several churches there. He says, I want you to take note of the grace of God. That's the power and divine influence of God that's been in those churches. Now go down to verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and look at those next three words, beyond their power. So to their power and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. What are we talking about? Paul is talking about churches that gave to missionary causes. Uh, churches that not only prayed, but gave money to finance missions and soul winning. They did it to their power. They did as much as they could. And watch this. They did more than they were able. They did beyond their power. How much beyond their power? We don't know. But they did beyond their power. They did more than what they could do. I ask a man, how much can you lift? He says, I can lift 100 pounds. Let me see you. And he strains and struggles and he gets 100 pounds up, throws it down. Well, let me see you do 150 pounds. He said, I can't do 150 pounds. I can only do 100 pounds. He said, I, I, my heart will burst. I'll die. I, I just can't get it off the ground. Well, maybe he's right. But what if he had supernatural power? You know, Samson, he was just an ordinary guy. But when supernatural power came upon him, I'll tell you something. Every guy in the world, when he learns about Samson, inside he says, boy, that'd be cool. Man, I wish for a day I could be Samson. I'd go and visit some of those guys, you know, who called me names. I'd, I'd go, you know, and find that girl who, you know, I, I'd show off, to, you know, to her. Every guy in the world at one point wishes he was Samson. Every guy. Uh, you know, for a little piece, piece of Samson's life anyhow. But there was only one Samson. But there's only one God. And that same God is here today. And so if a man says, I can only lift 100 pounds if the power of God came to help him, what do you think? Could he lift 150? Yes or no? Do you have any trouble believing that? If the power of God came upon a man, do you think that he could lift up 200 pounds? I think so. I know there's been cases of people under great stress and duress and they've lifted a car to get a loved one out. I've heard of that kind of thing. Uh, there's uh, documented cases of it. I know that. But how many of those people lifted the car right up uh, oh, off the ground, right over their head? Huh? How many of them did that? Eh. Not a one. Why? Too much for them. Too much for them. But if the power of God comes... They can lift that car up. They can throw it. They can be like those TV superheroes. Throw an automobile. When God gets involved. Now Paul is saying that the churches of Macedonia were giving. And they were able to give beyond their power. Now look at chapter uh, 8 and verse 7. Now Paul says, therefore as ye abound. He's talking to the church at Corinth now. As ye abound in everything. In faith and utterance and knowledge. And in all diligence and in your love to us. Now watch, he says, see that ye abound in this grace also. What grace is he talking about? Verse 1, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He says, you've been abounding in these other things. He's basically saying all Christians need to abound in the mir miraculous uh, uh, giving, in the miracle of giving. You say, how is it possible? Most every Christian will ask this question. How can I give what I don't have? How can I give when the pie is only so big and, and all of the pieces of the pie have been allotted for and I've got some here and some here and I can pay my rent and my gas, my insurance. I can put food on my table, but there's precious little left. How in the world can I, can I do anything? 
Now that's the picture. That's a good question. Paul gives us the answer, and it's in chapter 9. Just look, turn a page or something. Chapter 9 and verse 8. Now this verse, I want you to read it out loud with me. It is so powerful. Read it out loud together with me. Chapter 9, verse 8. Here we go. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. You see, it's not of you. It's not of me. God says he is able to make his grace abound. Not trickle in, abound toward us, so that we can now give to good causes. You see, this is the secret. It's the miracle. Your pie is only so big, and it's probably just big enough to feed you and your family and keep the wolves away from your door. And God is saying, let's do something together. Let's do a miracle together. Let's support missionaries. And you're looking at your pie and you're saying, Lord, I I don't understand. I can't see how. It's not possible there's, I mean, if I had a bigger pie, if I was a millionaire, maybe, Lord, I'm not. I never will be. My pie is only this big. What can I do, Lord? And this is where God says, you leave that to me. Because God is able to make all grace abound toward you. He's able to make all the pie abound toward you so that ye having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. We hear of a good work and we say, oh, I wish we could help. I wish there was something we could do. Well, we can. We can go to God and ask him to increase the size of our pie. We can go to God and ask him for more grace so that we can abound to these things. That's the miracle, folks. That's when God's Miraculous power gets involved with mathematics. All of a sudden, two plus two will equal whatever God wants it to. Five or six or even more. Because God is able to make all grace abound toward you and me. That's pretty exciting, folks. I get excited about that. You know, I think of how God wrote the Bible. And this blessed old book. Praise God for the Bible. It's the only book like it in the whole world. But men didn't write it of their own desire, their own will. No one got up one day and said, hmm, I think today I'm going to write the book of 2 Samuel. Hmm, yeah, that's what I'm going to do today. No one ever did that. Say, how do we get the Bible? Because God moved on the hearts of men and wrote the Bible through them. Basically, God is the author. Human instruments... God moved on their hearts and had them write what he wanted. We've got a blessed old book that's here forever, folks. God used some 40 different authors to write the Bible. Praise the Lord. And this same principle applies to the idea of faith promise giving. It's God doing it through us. It's not us going through our pockets and saying, "Well, well, what's in my wallet today? There's not much. I don't think I can do anything. No, no, it's God saying, let's do it together, you and me. You lay your hands on the weights on the dumbbell there. I'll put my hands on top of your hands and let's just see what we can do. There you are driving your car in the days before seatbelts. Now, this is going back a thousand years, I know. But in the days before seatbelts, sometimes dad, as he's driving the car, would have his child sitting on a lap. Now, you're not supposed to drive like that, but these are the days before seatbelts. Dad would be there, and little Junior would say, oh, can I, can I get in your lap, Daddy? All right. And so, you know, Junior would sit there and put his hands up on this great big wheel. You know, to him it was great big wheel. He'd put his hands up there, and he, he'd sit there in Daddy's lap and look over at Mommy. Look, Mommy, I'm driving the car. I'm driving the car. Dad's hands were on top of little Junior's hands, right? When God gets involved, when he puts his hands on top of our hands, Folks, that's where the, the impossible becomes possible. That's what faith promise is all about. That's why I'm talking about God's miraculous missionary mathematics. Because when it comes to supporting his favorite cause, getting the gospel around the world to get people saved, he wants to use us. He wants us to be part of that. You know what? We don't have much time. We've got uh, two weeks until Faith Promise Sunday. Now, I want to show you an important verse. If you'll go to the Gospel of Luke. Go to the Gospel of Luke right now. Turn up the fans, would you please? Luke chapter 
uh, number six. Luke chapter six. If it was up to you and I, we just don't have the power to send missionaries. We don't have the power to reach the, around the world with the gospel. We can't do it. But when God gets involved, you see, that's when the miracles happen. This means that he gives us the supernatural ability to give more than what we have, to give beyond our power. He brings it into us. Say, how does he do that? It's in Luke chapter 6, and look, please, at verse 38. Now, I'd like you to read this verse out loud with me. It's a powerful verse, and I want you to read it. Let's read it together. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, there's actually two principles there. And the second one is like sowing and reaping. But simply put, God tells you how much to give. And then he gives you that amount to give. Now, it first begins with our giving. Look at verse 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. There it is there. It takes faith to do the giving. If God just opened the roof of your house and dropped you down a big bag of money, oh, a bag of money. Oh, well, now I can give. That doesn't take faith. No faith at all. But when God says, this is what I want you to do, and you say, all right, Lord, I'm not sure if I can, but I, by faith, you know, Lord, I've toiled all the night long and caught nothing, but nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down my net, right? It's that same principle of faith. And when you take a step of faith, that's when God says, now open your pockets. Let me fill them. Give and it shall be given unto you. That's his promise. And he says, not just good measure, but he says, press down and not just press down, but shaken together and not just shaken together, but running over shall men give into your bosom. You will find that when you pray and seek God's face and say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? How much do you want me to be involved with? You show me, you tell me, Lord, impress on my heart. Make sure I know. You pray that way and very soon God will start to show you what to do. And when you say, you want me to give that? And God says, yes. And you say, okay. That's all God's waiting for. As you begin to give, God brings the supply. Your faith, His grace, that's how we reach the world. It's a miracle. Now, some of you already know that. Some of you have been doing it for years, and you already know that. I've been doing it for years, too. Uh, boy, it's exciting to get involved with God, I'll tell you. But we don't have a lot of time left. Faith Promise is all about seeking and yielding ourselves to God. And we've got two weeks till Faith Promise Sunday. And so we need to use the next two weeks very wisely. And I believe we need to fast and we need to pray to discern what God would have us give. On that green paper I've given you, there's three green papers, one each week, but this is the first one. It talks about Faith Promise on one side. On the other side, it asks you, please, to fast one meal. It could be a lunch or dinner or breakfast or something. One meal that you normally eat. Fast and pray and say, Lord, what would, you, what would you have me do? You won't die. I don't think you'll end up in a hospital. But if, if you've got a medical problem, then maybe you could just fast all your desserts for the week. How about that? Some people say, I would rather die. I know... <laughs> I understand dessert has a priority, but you see what I'm saying? Maybe if you're a big coffee fiend, you could fast your coffee through the week. Boy, there'd be a, you'd be at the end of the week, wouldn't you? Eh? So fast one meal, if you can. Fast one meal and use that time, those hunger pangs, and say, Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? Fasting chastens your soul. You'll get your prayers turbo boosted that way. You'll find out what God wants you to do. And um, then you just start doing it. After we know what God wants us to do, we start doing it, and then we start watching the miracle. Someone says, but will we get into financial trouble? Supposing God tells me to give an amount of money that scares me. Supposing God tells me to give something I don't have. That definitely spells trouble. 
uh, won't we get into trouble, financial trouble? The answer is no. Not if we do it God's way. If someone here thinks, oh boy, I'm just going to give everything. I'm going to sell my house. And I'm going to sell my neighbor's house. I'm going to sell every house on a block. And these people will just have to understand. I'm going to take all that money and give it to missions. Well, you've got a good heart, but your brain needs a little knock. Because uh, God doesn't call you to do that. He'll take you step at a time. It's like when your baby is learning how to walk. You say, hey, look, look, the baby's standing up. Okay, now, son, jump. Jump this far. It's a miracle he can stand. His next goal in life is to take one step and still be standing. That's his next goal in life. And God does the same for us. He takes a step at a time. But it's important that we know what that step is. That's why we need to fast and pray. Well, God will reward our act of faith. Now, I need to remind you this. You already know it. The devil's the enemy. He is our enemy. Anything you do for God, he's going to have something to say about it. Anything. And when it comes to financing missions, Satan bitterly opposes financial missions. Why? Because he knows it means people will get saved all around the world. One of our deacons, Brother Howard, keeps track of our missionary reports. They send us letters every three months. And every time they report about souls being saved, he writes that down. Once a quarter, he shows us up on the screen here what's happening on the mission field. And typically, every year, from our 56 missionaries that we support, we are seeing between 1,000 and 2,000 professions of faith around the world just from our missionaries. Satan hates that. He hates it, and he'll bitterly oppose it. That's why when you go to prayer, Satan is going to be right there and saying, would you give up? Would you just quit? You can't afford to give anything. If you give something, you're going to get yourself into trouble. These are just typical tricks the devil uses. So the devil says to you, listen, just, just give a, a tiny bit. Like, how about a nickel? You can afford, give a dime. Give 10 cents. Give, give 25 cents a month. Give 25 cents a month. That's all you can afford to do. Oh, yeah? Where's the devil when you walk into McDonald's? And say, I'll have two of those and four of those and six of these. And the bill comes up to $20 or $25, $30. You don't seem to have a problem finding the money for that. The devil never opposes that. But why is it that when it comes to the gospel and supporting missionaries that preach the gospel, the devil says, ooh, no, don't want to be crazy here. You know, ooh, maybe a dollar a month. Ooh, don't listen to that. Just give him a boot out the door. There was a, a rich man many years ago, and he had quite a bit. He was a farmer. And some people came to his door from the church and said, Brother, he said, there's one of the families. They're very poor. They're going to have a, a no, nothing for Christmas. Do you think you could give something for him? He says, I think I can. And as he's walking through his house out to the back where he's got his, his smokehouse there, that doesn't mean smoking. It means that they would take the meat and they would add smoke to it for flavor. As he was walking out there, he had in mind to, uh, to get a real nice section of ham there to give. And as he was going, the devil said, now, you know, you've got some smaller sections there. You've got some smaller pieces of meat. You know, you don't have to go overboard. And the guy started struggling in his heart. He at first thought he would, he would give a nice big chunk of, of ham as a gift, a bountiful gift to this poor family that's struggling. And the devil's saying, ooh, now just, you know, they won't know. You could just give something smaller. And he struggled and he struggled with this till finally he said, devil, if you don't leave me, I'll give them the whole smokehouse. Maybe that's what you need to do. Boot that old deceiver right down the street and say, if you don't leave me alone... Go back to God and say, Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? That's what you want. You want to know what God says. Not what the devil says. Not what the neighbor says. You want to know what God says. And that's going to take some prayer. And it's going to maybe take a little fasting too. Because, you know, sometimes we're hard of hearing. We've got, to, we've got to find out what God is saying. Galatians chapter 6 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You and I cannot expect to realize the blessings, the extra blessings of God, unless we 
show ourselves bountiful to him. If we show ourselves bountiful, if we're willing, then God is willing. If we're not willing, God is not willing. I'll tell you a quick story here about a, a farmer and a baker. And a, uh, a baker was buying a, uh, a pound of butter off a farmer. And he would do this um, every week, buy a pound of butter. And one day he decided he'd weigh the, the pound of butter, make sure he's getting a pound. He put it on his weight scales. <gasps> it wasn't anywhere near a pound. He was angry. And so he took the farmer to court. And uh, the judge looked at this case and said, uh, Mr. Farmer, what do you have to say about this? And the farmer, uh, he says, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure, Your Honor. Um, the, um, uh, the judge asked the farmer, well, do you, do you have any kind of measuring device? And the farmer says, well, Your Honor, I'm, I'm a very poor farmer. I don't have a lot, and I don't have any kind of fancy measuring device, but I, I do have a scale. The judge says, well, how do you measure a pound of, of butter to, to the baker? How do you do that? And the farmer says, well, Your Honor, long before the baker started buying a pound of butter off me, I was buying a loaf of pound bread off of him. And then one day he decided he wanted to buy a pound of butter off me. And so what I would do is I would take the pound loaf and put it in one side of the scale and I would add enough butter till it measured it equaled with the pound loaf and that's the butter I would give him. Now, do you see where the problem was? That baker was so angry, he was getting less than a pound. It was his own fault. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And that baker, he was sowing less than a pound. And he was reaping less than a pound of butter. So we can't go around blaming God if we're not seeing the extra blessings, if we ourselves are not willing to be uh, uh, used of God. But God changes the dynamics when it gets to supporting worldwide missions. And for this, God uses the supernatural influence. And for these people that'll get involved, he makes this promise, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosoms. It's when you get involved, it's when I get involved in serving God with some finance, in supporting missionaries, that God gets involved and says, wow, now I'm going to do my part. You do your part, I'll do my part. And miracles happen. So again, why are we involved with worldwide missions? It's because God wants people saved. God's solution to getting people saved around the world is called missions. God wants to do it through us and with us, in partnership with us. Our part is to ask him, what do you want me to do? His part is to make it happen. My question is, why don't we start today? We got two weeks before Faith Promise Sunday. On that Sunday, we're going to distribute some cards. No one writes their name on it, but everyone writes an amount what they feel that God is telling them to give. We add those all up, and then we decide what we're able to do, if we can take on support of more missionaries. we got two weeks. It's plenty of time if we start today. Why don't you start today? On the invitation, why don't you come and say, Lord, I'm beginning. I'm going to start today. Lord, would you show me? What do you want me to do? What part do you want me to play? What wouldst thou have me to do? That's what your prayer should be. Now, we've been talking today about God's mathematics for missions. But just before we bow in prayer, can I say this, that perhaps you're here today and all that you have going for you are the natural laws of this world. The natural laws of the universe. That's all you've ever known. That's all you've got going for you. There's no miraculous in your life. Your natural laws are not adding up to eternal life. Why? Why not? I'll tell you why. Because the sins that you've added to your life every day, every year, over the years, have brought about the normal, logical, natural result of eternal separation from God in a place called hell. And if that's your case, you are in desperate need of some of God's very special mathematics. And I want you to see it. You put that picture up there, Glenn. You can do that for me. There we go. This is God's special math. One cross 
plus three nails equals four given. Now, there's a play on words there, but do you see the... I wish I had invented that. Man, there are people far smarter than me that come up with these things. But the truth of the gospel is staring you right in the face. If you're here today and you don't know for sure, for sure, for sure, if you're sure you've never been born again, or if you're just questioning, well, have I, haven't I? Man, I want to know for sure. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want to know if something happened to me, I'd open my eyes and there'd be Jesus. I'd be standing in heaven. I want to know that. But I just don't know for sure. This is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. This is your need before faith promise missions. This is what you should be praying before you pray anything else. Is Lord, would you be merciful to me? I'm the sinner that Jesus died for. I'm the guy that should be in hell. And Jesus died for me. He paid what I owe in hell. And by the way, he rose again the third day, folks. He's alive today. Maybe he's knocking on someone's heart door today. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking to yourself, well, that's probably me. How can I know for sure? How can I be born again? Well, what's holding you back? You know enough. It's by faith. You know that you're a sinner. You know your sin has separated you from God. And one day when life is over for you, it's into the precipice, over the precipice, into, into hell. You know that. The Bible tells you that. You just got to believe it. The wages of sin is death. But the gift... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. He'll give it to you. If you'll come clean, confess your sin, and ask him to forgive you and come in your heart. That's how I got saved. 19-year-old back in April the 6th, 1975, I got on my knees and I prayed the best I know, knew how. Lord, would you forgive my sins? Come into my heart right now. Be my Savior. What happened? He did. He came in my heart and he was my Savior. Oh, praise his name. Oh, listen, folks, let's bow our heads for prayer right now, shall we?